everyone. My name is Vivian Schick. I'm a member of the Bitwarden marketing team, and I'm very happy to be with all of you today with our guest speaker, Rachel Toback. So our agenda, we're going to do a little bit of intros. Uh, we're going to start uh, some Q&A and a little bit of a fireside chat. And then Rachel's going to hack me. So that will be exciting. And then um, please feel free to send over any questions that you may have uh, during this event. I like to throw out a few keywords that I've learned about Rachel in the last couple of weeks that, you know, I've been listening to some of her previous podcasts. I've been reading about her. And um, I just thought some of these keywords were very interesting to her overall story and, and how she got to be where she is, which is an ethical hacker and CEO of Social Proof. Uh, so some of these words include neuroplasticity, psychology, a uh, special ed teacher, bad student, um, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, dyscalcic. 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 It's the numbers <laughs> version of dyslexia. Yes. Yes. Open mic poetry, music, musical theater, improv, and last but not least, brain surgery on rats. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully... <laughs> So hopefully these words have piqued your interest here about Rachel, and we'll uh, we'd love to maybe Rachel we can work in some of these words and and in our conversation for the next thirty or forty minutes. That's like an improv prompt. <laughs> you ask people from the audience like a lot of series of words, and we're going to work them into the next hour. Yeah, I can do that. Yep. Okay, so before so in terms of our agenda, you know, uh, I'd like to maybe first start with just uh, the, the story around social engineering and cyber attacks and how they impact individuals like you and I. And then maybe shift gears a little bit to talk a little bit about how they impact uh, organizations and companies. I mean, there's definitely a lot, a, a lot more monetary weight when it comes to organizations and companies getting hacked um, and, and employees falling into social engineering uh, situations. So before we begin all of that, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe you can incorporate some of those words that we just I just threw out there. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I am the CEO of Social Proof Security. We are a social engineering prevention company. So. Social engineering, in case you're not familiar, basically just means human hacking, hacking the human element of security. And the way that we do social engineering prevention is through trainings, video security awareness, workshops, events, speaking with the media so the general public can learn more about what these attacks look like and how to avoid falling for them. I'm also the chair of the board of WISP, Women in Security and Privacy, where we work to advance women to lead in both fields. And I sit on the Technical Advisory Council for CISA under Jen Easterly, which is like the coolest thing ever. Jen is one of the coolest people in cybersecurity. So tell me, why do you do what you do? Yeah, I love hacking people because it's like a puzzle that you have to solve. It's my job to figure out how people are vulnerable and teach that to them before the bad folks get there. Yeah. A lot of people say bad guys, but I'm I'm a, a woman, so I'd say bad folks. Um, I hack people through phone calls, emails, text messages, social media DMs, pretty much any way that you communicate with human beings, I hack people through that method. And later on, just for the audience, FYI, in case you missed it, um, when I when I lost connection, uh, Rachel will be hacking me. Um, please be nice to me, Rachel, later oh. on <laughs> in this conversation. So I folks, will. hang on to that, um, and you will see see Vivian shit get hacked. Um, so when you when you consider a hack, what what are you what are you targeting, and why, and uh, sure. What would you go after and how how would you go about it? And, um, and obviously people will see this happen live later on, but maybe you can yeah. walk us through a little bit of the highlights. Sure. So typically I am targeting people who have a high level of admin access, people who can uh, change an email address or a phone number on the account, can send money, have access to the social media accounts. Um, are able to give me access to internal documents or sensitive data. So those are people like customer support, sales, finance, basically yeah. anybody who is human facing within their role. Um, 
Also, people in marketing have to talk to the media and deal with PR and all of those things. So if you have a social media presence, if you have kind of any sort of relationship to the public where you take requests or receive inbound communication in any way, it's likely that I would target you in a penetration test. But yeah. remember, I only do hacking when I'm asked to do so. I have to have consent. Otherwise, it's I'm just a cyber criminal. There's no difference between <laughs> me and somebody who goes to jail. Agreed. Yes, yeah. understood. Uh, and for everyone's FYI, Rachel does have my consent to hack me. That is um, <laughs> so I, I there's there's been a, a story that's just gone viral, and um, yes. it, it's a story that appeared I, I think in the cut, and it was written by a financial advice columnist who chronicles how she got scammed out of $50,000. Um, and I think the name of this is the $50,000 shoebox scam. And I think it really um, just dives into the psychological aspect of how people fall into a scam like that. Right. And um, I'm going to have you, uh, you know, explain and, and give a little bit of overview of what happened to um, to this person, to, to the writer of this article. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I also think that it was really interesting as I was reading some of the comments after the article. And I always think the comment section is sometimes more interesting than the article itself. Um, and there was a lot of judgment. Uh, oh. People were really judgy about it <laughs> and, and, and shame, you know, shaming her for falling into the scam. So maybe you can speak a little bit about that. But first, um, why don't you, if, if you could, for the audience, just kind of describe what, what this article was about and what happened to her. Sure. So this woman, she was the financial columnist for The Cut, um, a journalistic agency that does a lot of kind of op-eds. And she was convinced through a phone call that first and foremost, her Amazon account had been broken into and she had been involved in some sort of money laundering, some type of cyber crime. They were a little vague about what actually happened here. She then was passed off from Amazon support, it said that on her caller ID, to somebody who was in the IRS, potentially the FBI, the FTC. It was um, very much trying to appeal to a level of authority to her, telling her that she had been involved in a crime um, and that she was going to go to jail unless she was able to process uh, this payment that was owed of her in relationship to this quote unquote crime that she had committed. Um, and she got passed back and forth to multiple people, but ultimately she ended up putting $50,000 cash in a shoebox and handing it to somebody in a car and they drove away with it. So a lot of people were super cruel in the comments. Like I would never fall for a scam like this. And sure, maybe you wouldn't, um, but maybe a family member of yours would, a friend, a community member. So even if you don't feel like you'd fall for it, it's still important to understand this because we have to protect the people around us. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of wild because people think only older folks fall for scams. When in, re in reality, the FTC data has showed that younger adults, Gen Z, millennials, Gen X, um, are actually more likely to report that they've lost money to fraud and more money than those over 60. Yeah. So it, that might just be they're more likely to report it. But I think we're seeing scams hit younger folks and older folks alike. And a lot of people just don't admit that they're mm -hmm. falling for these scams. So some examples of scams that we see hit the younger generations are things like job scams, um, where you get maybe contacted from somebody who's saying that they have a job position available for you, uh, when in reality, this job is not real, or they're posing as an organization that um, is not actually hiring or not hiring for that role. And they go ahead and convince you to send over 250 bucks to gain access to uh, work from home computer or a microphone yeah. or something like that. So yeah. job scams, rental scams, gift card scams, IT support, your sister is arrested and needs bail. I mean, there's all sorts of scams that are hitting younger folks too. And well-educated people. Exactly. Yeah. I, I read some of that, the statistics from the Federal Trade Commission. I think what what's also interesting with her story is that um, as I was reading it, it she there were 
no, a number of times where she was like, I think I'm getting scammed. I think, right. I think this, there's something wrong here. Right. Um, and she suspected that her identity had gotten stolen. Her bank tried to warn her. Her husband, I think, was on the other side of the phone telling her, you know, what are you doing? Don't do this. Stop. <laughs> but, but after all of that, she ended up literally putting 50, running to the bank, getting $50,000, drawing, withdrawing $50,000 out of the bank, putting in a shoebox and presenting it and giving it to an undercover agent in a car. Um, and yeah, and, and I think you had mentioned, you had referenced um, a book in, in some of your other talks, uh, the, the Power of Influence or The Power of P Persuasion. It's a book by uh, Robert uh, Kel Yes. And I, I, I did see some of that uh, reflected in the story. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the principles of reciproci reciprocity, right? So our tendency to want to repay or want to do something for another person, um, the principle of authority. So we are uh, more likely to say yes to others who we perceive as being in an authority figure. Do you see some of that play out in, in these uh, phishing and scam situations? Almost every single time. I have not really heard of a scam that's super successful that doesn't leverage urgency and fear, reciprocity, and appeal to authority. Um, pretty much every single scam is going to do that. In fact, even this scam used the principle of liking, which is more rare in the phishing schemes that we see today. Typically, they just leverage urgency and fear to convince somebody that they need to take this action or they're going to go to jail or something yeah. like that. Um, this one actually used liking because they got this woman on the phone with a customer support agent who was also a woman and was very kind mm -hmm. throughout the entire scam, trying to be supportive. Oh, let me see how I can help you. Um, almost like a friend in this scenario, like, don't worry about him. Like we got you covered. And that principle of liking is, is more rare. So these folks know what they're doing and they're leveraging a lot of the principles of persuasion that we see, yeah. um, without throughout these scams. Yeah. So how, how could we as individuals and consumers, um, how can we, uh, you know, be more on alert and, and, kind of prevent and protect ourselves from falling into such scams? There are two things that I recommend. If somebody is trying to tell you that you have to speed up and do this thing right now while I'm on the phone with you within 24 hours of an email, right now via chat, that's usually a signal to you that a scam is underway. Yeah. There are very few things that we have to do in this life that are true emergencies that have to happen within five, 10, 15 minutes, right? Yeah. These things pop up. Sometimes we have fires at work, right? We got to do something really quickly. But if someone is telling you that they need money, access, or data immediately right now, and you have to stay on the phone or you have to stay on the line, or I need you to email me back as you're at the bank, that's a really good signal that a scam is underway. That's mm -hmm. using the principle of urgency and fear to convince you to do something really fast. It, it's something that we call amygdala hijacking. It's a part of what I've learned in neuroscience. I'm adding in neuroplasticity plasticity <laughs> because you mentioned that earlier, Vivian. So People mark, you can check yeah, that check mark for <laughs> if you have a bingo card. Um, in, uh, in neuroscience, we have uh, this principle of amygdala hijacking and your amygdala is the emotional center of your brain. And it reacts a half step faster than the rational portion of your brain. So if I can use some sort of convincing argument that's emotional, scary, fear-based, urgency, mm -hmm. those types of elements convince you to do something way faster because the amygdala in your brain, it's there to protect you and it helps you react really fast and it brings yeah. up that adrenaline response. So yeah. we have to be able to recognize adrenaline in the moment, recognize a sense of urgency, recognize a sense of fear. And the second piece also is if they tell you that you shouldn't talk to somebody, your spouse, the cops, um, calling the FTC on a different number, that's another signal to you that you are in the middle of a scam. Yeah. If they tell you you can't talk to somebody about it, there's no scenarios in real life where you, you can't, you're not allowed to talk to the cops unless you're with the mafia, yeah. right? And that's also probably criminal activity. So I just, I want people to understand 
when they see those types of situations, noticing them, mm-hmm. being able to say to themselves, it's likely that I'm in the middle of a scam, hang yeah. up, take a beat, take a deep breath, and talk to a trusted member of your community, friend, family member, or just a neighbor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my husband recently um, was receiving a series of texts from someone that he didn't recognize. And yeah. this person obviously, I think, had done some research on him online. Sure. And so they said, hey, my husband's name, um, you're, you're from class of the year from the school, right? It's me. How are you doing? And my husband Ooh. replied, yeah, I'm doing great. Who is this? Oh, the initials are SJ. And he's like, oh, is it, is it you? How's your daughter doing? And so they Mm -hmm. went back and forth a little bit. And I said, I think this is a scam. You should, you should block them. Do you think that was Rachel? I mean, I mean, people are weird sometimes, right? Yeah. So like some, the problem is the challenge. And the reason why people fall for scams is because real people do weird things all the yeah. time. Uh, we can do strange things in yeah. our authentic communication too. Yeah. It's possible that wasn't a scam. My guess is that a person who really graduated with your father would not <laughs> use their initials. It sounded like they were trying to bait him into saying a name that they would then mm-hmm. use as their pretext. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's shifty for sure. Yeah. If they're a real person, it's weird. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can find somebody's phone number, email address in a data brokerage site within five minutes. So yeah. being able to contact someone, look them up on, say, LinkedIn and find where they graduated from and impersonate someone that they graduated from not hard and oftentimes can convince you to join a crypto scam or some sort of romance scam or financial scam. And so we have to be on, on kind of high alert for that. Yeah. How do you, so not a day goes by where you don't hear about uh, the impact of artificial intelligence. And I'm sure AI is going to play a big role here. Um, what, what do you see on the horizon? Oh my gosh. Well, it's not even really on the horizon. It's, it's wow. happening right now, which is pretty frightening. Um, So what we're seeing is that AI kind of scales our ability to build build our pretext. That's who we are pretending to be, who we're kind of uh, masquerading as. And so with tools like ChatGPT, for instance, it can make an attack more believable because it's coming up with the right pretext, who to pretend to be, the right language to use, authentic sounding language. For instance, I can put into ChatGPT, write an email to a bank customer telling them that they need to change their password within the next 24 hours. And maybe if I weren't very good at writing copy, the email would come off shady. Mm -hmm. But ChatGPT's email is mimicking real banking emails all over the world, and it looks authentic. So tools like that allow us to um, more scalable in a more believable way, make it easier to execute the attacks. We can do voice clones using AI, Um, you know, a tool like an AI tool chaining together with other AI tools can look up a picture of you, reverse image search your face using uh, a tool called PimEyes, look you up, find the right pretext using an AI chat tool, spoof the right phone number using software, place calls, have a dynamic conversation with a voice clone, ask for MFA codes. I mean, there's kits that are that are built for this. So we're only going to see these attacks become more believable, scalable, easier to execute, which is scary. That's another reason why it's very important to have technical tools to back you up so that if you don't recognize the scam in the moment, you don't necessarily give away the keys to the kingdom. Mm-hmm. If you have a good password mm-hmm. manager, it's going to be harder to gain access to everything. If you have good multi-factor authentication, then the attacker is going to have to continue to attack you to gain access to codes. Or if you have a YubiKey or PassKey, mm-hmm. I mean, it's going to be really, really tough to, to steal. Yeah. yeah. So so that's a great segue into uh, the second part of our conversation, which is the impact of Uh, social engineering attacks on larger companies and organizations. Um, Again, you you don't, uh, if you read the headlines, you know how much money is at stake here for companies if they experience a data breach through a social engineering attack. Um, I've I've heard you say before that uh, the open source community has some built-in pillars that help protect um, 
folks against social near, social engineering attacks that that you do. Um, obviously, Bitwarden is an open source company. Um, and what what do you think we have in place? What Bitwarden, as an open source company, have in place that prevent those attacks from being successful? Yeah, I mean, the open source community has a lot of elements to it that other organizations don't have that make it way harder for us to successfully attack. So first there's transparency. The open source community has to be super open, honest about the code that's written. Um, it can be evaluated by anyone within that community. Um, and there are certain requirements for participating in the, in the project and reviewing the code. So things like you got to make sure that you're not reusing your passwords, you've got to have MFA. Um, there's also good things like vigilance and verification. So people are paying attention to the code. There are checks and balances in place. Members of the open source community have to verify each other's work. They've got to verify people are who they say they are and you know knowledge of them from past projects. Um, there are good reporting mechanisms in place. So there's open lines of communication. People know how to report. The reporting mechanisms are there. They don't have to come up with that on the fly. Mm -hmm. There's also distributed decision making. So there's multiple people that have to make decisions. It's kind of like a built in two person principle, or sometimes called the four eyes principle, where two individuals are required to make big changes to make a big, you know, sensitive change within the code base or allow somebody access to something sensitive. And then, of course, there's requirements, things like technical tools, mandatory MFA pass keys or password managers that are built into the open source communities kind of frame of uh, of work where it's required to be a part of the project. Um, and so I think the open source community has a lot going for it to protect from a lot of these kind of strange elements that we yeah. see when we hack companies that don't have open source. Yeah. So you mentioned pass keys um, and Bitwarden has uh, has made tremendous innovations around passwordless authentication, including passkeys, FIDO2, WebAuthn-based passkeys. How how does the introduction of passkeys in general affect you as a hacker? Does has it changed the way you approach a target? Oh yeah, uh, when a target has a passkey or has a FIDO solution in place for MFA, something like a YubiKey or a Google Titan key or any other passkey solution. Um, it makes password stealing and gaining access to accounts incredibly challenging. Mm -hmm. I have to attempt to hack so many different ways. I mean, I really have to get malware introduced into the system to be mm -hmm. successful in any capacity. And we know that most attackers, when they're trying to gain access, they're not as sophisticated as that. You know, they log in at, rather than actually technically gaining access right off the bat. Their initial access point typically is just a, a credential. Yeah. So... When I gain act, when I attempt to gain access to an organization that has a passkey or a FIDO solution in place for MFA, it's so complex that I just attempt to move on to another target, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a third party, someone involved with them that doesn't have the passkeys or FIDO solutions. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, a lot of times I just move on because it's just not worth the amount of time that it's going to take and the amount of customization <laughs> for malware to gain access. Yeah, as as part of your your work, um, you help companies um, get smarter about cybersecurity mm -hmm. um, and you help companies implement and conduct penetration testing. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what is penetration testing and how what is your approach in working with companies if they are uh, looking to you to help them design a penetration test? Sure. Well, I do social engineering penetration testing. So social engineering penetration testing is where we emulate how adversaries attempt to gain access, typically with initial entry points to, to an organization. So that might be attacking over the phone, email, text message, social media DM, chat, like a Teams chat, external chat or something like that. Um, and so the first thing that I have to do is understand if the company is a good in a good place for a social engineering pen test. You might have heard me say this before. If you listen, I think you listen to some of my podcasts, Vivian. Mm -hmm. I actually turn down the majority of the requests for penetration tests because mm -hmm. the company is actually not at the point where they're ready to withstand a social engineering attack. And it's not useful to an organization for me to hack in within 30 seconds. You know, I want to get them to a place first where their protocols and procedures for the human element of security are so um, 
challenging for me to get past that it takes me multiple attempts. That's actually useful for the team for their learnings. So mm -hmm. typically actually before I go in and actually penetration test or hack the company, I will do something called a protocol walkthrough workshop where I sit down with their client facing members of their team, like customer support, call center, finance, HR, marketing, et cetera. Um, and we talk through what are the methods that I would use to convince you? How would I trick you? Would mm -hmm. I pretend to be somebody from the New York Times to trick your PR team? Would I pretend to be a customer to your customer support team? What protocols do you have in place to verify people are who they say they are? Do you go ahead and just click any link that they send you within a support chat? Do you troubleshoot by using a sandbox without just looking at that thing that they sent you over chat? Um, there's a lot of methods that they can put in place and barriers to support avoiding falling for these social engineering attacks before I actually go in and pen test them. Oh, but, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So we have to upgrade a lot of those human mm -hmm. element um, kind of protections before we go in and test them. But if they are ready to go, they update their protocols or the protocols are already in place to verify people are who they say they are, then I'll go ahead and actually place those calls pretending to be an executive to their assistant or pretending to be a customer to customer support to see if I can do account takeover, steal money, sensitive data and more. So um, it's a really fun process. I love penetration testing, but it's not right for every single company. And I think people don't always expect that from me. They're yeah. like, oh, I thought you always wanted to hack. It's like, I, I, I do, but I want you to get something good out of it. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to just sit there and go, oh, we're totally demoralized because you hacked us within 30 seconds. That doesn't actually support anybody. Yeah. So, so in addition to the protocol session that you hold with companies, if you if you feel like they're maybe they're not quite ready yet, in okay. addition to looking at the human element of this, uh, do you provide any um, advice for companies on tools that they could be using uh, that they may not have in their cybersecurity stack? Um, yeah. And I'm trying to see if we can. Uh, make a push for password manager, but I'll let you do that. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. Um, a huge part of the process of getting prepared is having the technical tools in place. And most organizations that I chat with have multi-factor authentication. Most of them do. I would say almost every organization has some sort of MFA. I'd like to move them to app-based MFA or pass keys or something like that. But mm -hmm. many of the organizations that I chat with do not have a password manager in place. And so a huge part of working with them to get them ready for something like an attack is getting the right password manager and solution in place for them. Yeah. You know, they need to be able to see, is this the right site that I'm going to? And password managers that lay in the browser like that can say, not the right site, look alike, looks like the site, but we're not going to actually put your password in. So getting them prepared to understand what are the tools that we need? How do we need to get set up and everything is, um, it's a huge part of the process. And a lot of them have thought that they had some sort of password manager solution or they recommended a password manager solution, but it wasn't mandatory. And if things aren't mandatory, then, you know, a lot of times people don't actually put them in, into place yeah. um, or they, they think, oh, I've got a single sign on solution. That's enough. And they forget that there are so many things in people's personal and professional lives that they're not covered under the single sign on tool. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you've got to have password management and you've got to have single sign on. And then they're like, but what about password list? Isn't that happening? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. In the next one to three to five years, though, we're still going to see passwords. So yeah. we definitely need to make sure that we have good password management. We have good pass key integration as that, you know, gets uh, adopted in more and more sites and password managers can continue to help you with that. So this is this is probably a, a big question and it's probably going to be hard to just pinpoint one thing. But what is what is the one action you would encourage an organization to take um, that would have the biggest impact on their overall digital security? It's hard to come up with just one. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be an improviser and say more than one. <laughs> Another checkbox for those who have the bingo card going. Um, I would say first and foremost, most organizations, like I mentioned, do not have a password management solution. So making sure that you have some sort of password management solution internally that's mandatory for your organization is really important. Second, enabling multi-factor authentication and the right MFA for your threat model. So 
if we have somebody who's got a super elevated threat model, they've got 20,000 followers on Twitch, they've got a huge Instagram following, and they have admin access at work, we need that individual in their personal and professional life to have a password manager, personally and professionally. They've got to have MFA on every account, personally and professionally. And a lot of times people are not at that level. Maybe they have something in their personal life, but not professional, or their company hasn't adopted it all the way for everyone. Um, and then the last thing is just verifying that people are who they say they are. You get a phone call, it says it's your bank, hang up and call the bank back using the phone number on the back of your card, not the phone number that they tell you to use, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I kind of blew past your one and gave you three, but yeah. <laughs> providing value. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. So, hey, Rachel, let's shift gears now. And why don't we go through the live hack session? With okay. Um, and then I'm going to leave some room for Q&A because we do have um, a few comments that are popping up here with people with some great questions. So I did want to leave, leave room for that and make sure that your questions are being answered by Rachel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so okay, I'm really nervous. <laughs> uh, you should you should not be nervous. I this is the first time I'm seeing this, so <laughs> I promise you do not need to be nervous. Okay, I'm assuming that you can see that. Is that right? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. So first and foremost, thank you, Vivian. Can we get a round of applause in the chat for Vivian for being such a <laughs> support here? Um, so Vivian has given me permission to do a how I would hack you live demo. This is not how I did hack you or how I will hack you. No actual hack is taking place. This is just talking through theoretically what I would do as an attacker. So we're not even friends on LinkedIn. We got to change that. I mean, we will be friends. Now. We're friends now. <laughs> we're friends now. Um, so first and foremost, when I'm hacking somebody, I need to figure out how I'm going to contact them. And I can typically find people by um, going on a data brokerage site. And a data brokerage site is a site that tries to sell access to your personal details, like your phone number, your email address, et cetera. Um, this uh, data brokerage site is, I believe, called Rocket Reach. Really, really easy to find. Uh, kind of pops up on Google when you type in somebody's name. And I'm able to find multiple email addresses and passwords. Now, you don't need to confirm anything here, but looking at this at a high level, are you like, Okay, yeah, I can see what the information is that's like blocked out here, but we're not going to like reveal and dox you, right? But what are your thoughts just looking at this? Yeah, that it's it's definitely, you know, I I am I do try to be very careful with what I put online, and I did take myself off of certain social media platforms uh, be, for this reason. So I yeah. I took myself off of Facebook. I would take myself off of Twitter or X, but it's sort of part of my job, so I can't, uh, but it's still definitely, you know, it's still definitely a little bit more than I would prefer to be out there. Um, I'm a little concerned that I, that there seems to be two phone numbers out there as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as much as I've, I've tried to be careful, I'm still concerned that there's again, still more than I would like. Yeah. And the thing is, you can be careful and do everything right. And these data brokerage sites can still find your personal information and post it online. So it's really no fault of your own, honestly. Um, these are these email addresses, these four email addresses we were able to find and the two phone numbers, they're probably just part of a data breach, honestly. Like mm -hmm. no fault of your own. You can't make it so that a company that you trust with your data doesn't get hacked. Yeah. But we can sign up for tools like haveibeenpwned.com, PW. NED, have I been pwned, which tell us, okay, my email address and passwords are showing up there. I got to make sure I don't reuse that anywhere. And I got to make sure I change it everywhere and turn on MFA. And, you know, of course you have a password manager, so you're not going to be reusing passwords, but let's talk a little bit about passwords. So this is a site called dehashed.com. It's a data breach repository site. It takes all of the stuff that's on the dark web, that's on the regular clear net in data breaches, kind of compiles it into one spot. And we can find multiple passwords. So I actually found 30 plus passwords from you that were used in the past. I'm not going to show them here. Don't worry about that. Yeah. I've blocked them out. But you can look at kind of like one letter that I've revealed here to kind of show yourself, oh my gosh, I do recognize mm -hmm. that password from my past. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting that that's showing up here. Again, just highlighting the essential nature of a password manager. I'm sure all of these things that are involved in these breaches, these 30 plus passwords, you don't use them anymore. 
you've got Bitwarden, you're using a password manager, you're using MFA. So these are issues from your past, but they're not going to affect you now. Now, most people, this type of stuff I can find, I can find 15 passwords on somebody usually within five minutes, just by putting in their phone number or their email address that I find on that data brokerage site at the top here. Um, and most people have not changed their passwords. So I'm just able to log in as them. And we know the majority of people don't use MFA. I mean, on Twitter, they released their stats in like 2021. 2.7% of people are using a second step to log in. So for most individuals, I can find their password and just log in as them. And it's, again, no fault of their own because they didn't know that they were involved in this data breach. But now we kind of have to make it something that they're aware of. You can find your passwords that you're reusing. I can log into all your accounts, log into your email and steal all your other accounts, log into your bank account and steal your money. I mean, just like really frightening stuff. What are your thoughts on this? Like, are you seeing letters that you recognize from old passwords here? Yeah, I do. I, I recognize the email, um, the first couple letters of that email. And that email is um, kind of our, my junk folder email, if you will. Uh, but still, that's still a little disconcerting to see that, you know, there's all these passwords out there associated with that email. Yeah. So there's another email that I see that starts with my name. And I feel like that's, that's my actual, that could be my actual email, my real email that I use. Um, so yeah. so disconcerting overall, but yeah. yes, this is, I, I think a lot of this hopefully is from my past because, you know, with using Bitwarden, I've now been able to change all of my passwords across all of my accounts super easily right. using long, unique, complex passwords. Um, and just, you know, it, it's all made it incredibly easy for us to manage all of that. So hopefully, if you try to hack me in another year or so, it'll look better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love that I'm looking at this stuff and I'm thinking there's no way that she still uses these passwords. Mm -hmm. Like if you have Bitwarden, it generates a long random unique password. Password managers do that for you. Mm -hmm. I love to hear that you're doing that because that's going to make my life incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. I want ultimately to be so annoyed that I just move on to somebody else. Yeah. Okay. So let's get into your pretext. This is who I'm pretending to be if I were to mm -hmm. hack you. So your information about where you went to school, public innocuous. We talk about where we went to school all the time. It's not a secret. It shouldn't be a secret, but we have to be politely paranoid about how information that's not a secret could be used to trick us. So for instance, I might pretend to be from the University of Pennsylvania or from Temple University. And I might say something like, Hey, Vivian, uh, my name is Allison with, uh, the alumni association of the University of Pennsylvania. We are scheduling, uh, former, students to come speak to prospective students happening here in June. We're so excited to potentially chat with you because you have such a unique background and you have such a, a great role at Bitwarden. We're paying folks $5,000 as an honorarium to come speak. Mm -hmm. uh, are you available? And can you tell us your availability, which would then give them maybe a Google form, a lookalike Google form that is malicious attempting to access your Google credentials. Mm -hmm. Now, Again, I don't think you would fall for this, but I want to show you how totally innocuous information could be used against you. And it's so important to understand how we would try to steal your password and why it's important to not reuse your passwords and yeah. use a password manager. So what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think I could see that working just, you know, thinking about the the, the book we referenced earlier in our conversation, um, Influence, right? Um, and I think one of the pillars that he talks about is liking. So um, our, our inclination to agree with people we like mm -hmm. and uh, the, the inclination for others to agree with us if we like them. And so I, I, I think like if someone from my alma mater were to call me, and and kind of resurface like nostalgia and um, someone that you know I'm connected to somehow from my past, you know, a sh sharing of a good memory. I I would see that working honestly as a social engineering um, attempt. Yeah, and these these ones do work very frequently, even for folks who are in infosec and they know that these types of things are coming down the pipeline. Amir says something really interesting in the chat that I want to touch on here, saying the average person 
when you tell them about a password manager, they say, I have nothing to hide. Mm -hmm. It's just such a really unique uh, opportunity for us to discuss this. People don't realize it's not about what you have to hide. It's what you have to lose. Mm -hmm. Do you have money? Do you have sensitive healthcare data? Do you have information about your children and their schooling and their health care? Do you have an Instagram for your dog and it has 500 of your you know, favorite followers? What about a personal Twitter that you like to keep up with the news or a TikTok where you have great bookmarks and folders? Losing all of that, losing access to your Gmail and all your records means a lot. And yeah. losing access to your password is a really big problem for people, especially when they reuse it, which is why I recommend not reusing your passwords and using a password manager. Okay, so here we have a review um, written. I'm not going to say if it's written by you to this person named Dave or Dave to you. There's no need to get into the details here. And I've kind of blocked out all of it because there's no need to involve Dave in your life hacking demo, right? But what would I do as an attacker? I would pr probably pretend to be Dave to you. Mm -hmm. I would probably look up Dave's email address, phone number, and I'd send you an email from a lookalike account saying, hey, Vivian, how are you? We haven't chatted in uh, you know a, a month or so. I want to reach out because I'm applying for a new role. My portfolio does include some of our prior interactions together, some of the projects we've worked on, email, Slack interactions, just things I want to make sure that you're comfortable with me publishing before I go ahead and give this out. Um, so can you review this by end of week? Let me know any thoughts. And thanks so much. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are here for this Dave pretext. Yeah, I can I can also see that working as a social engineering effort because again, it is it's connecting me to someone I know, someone I have a history with, someone I trust, right. someone I want to help out. So I I definitely I you know, definitely a very compelling um offer. For yeah, sure. absolutely. Um and we we see these people in our lives and we want to support them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, a lot of times that overrides some of the security mindset that we have. Yeah. Okay. Now we have an old kind of license or certification or credential that you've received. It doesn't quite matter how old these things are. These still tend to be really salient and useful in attacking. So your credentials that you receive, they do not need to be private. The whole purpose of getting a credential is to post it publicly. So I would never tell you, take this down. I would just say, be aware of how it could be used. Mm -hmm. So an attacker could see this on your LinkedIn. They could pretend to be from ABM certification, emailing you saying, hi, Vivian, we got a report for misuse for certification 4956 for ABM certification foundations from demand base. We wanted to let you know that we went ahead and took down your credential. So that's no longer um, going to be something that displays on our site, even if it was a past credential. If you'd like to learn more about this report and why it was filed, go ahead and click here or check out this attachment. And this, this kind of elicits a sense of fear. Like even if you don't care about a credential because it's like five years in the past, 10 years in the past, you're thinking, who reported me for misuse of a credential? What, what What's going on here? So you want to learn more. Um, and oftentimes we send these at 5.45 a.m. your time so that you see it right when you wake up on your phone and you're like, credential misuse, what? And you go ahead and click and a lot of people's phones or computers are out of date and boom, you have known vulnerabilities that could be exploited mm -hmm. against you. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, um, I mean, this is an old credential for me. So I I guess if I saw that, I, I, I don't know if I would care that much about it, but um, for for folks with, you know, if they're in a career where credentials and licensing and continuing education, and that's that's a very critical part of their career. Absolutely. This is this this is absolutely very compelling. Right. Because it is their reputation that's at stake. It's their career that could be at stake. So yeah. um, and, and there's that there's a sense of urgency to fix something that um, may be presented incorrectly about you. Um, yeah. and, and others within, you know, that you respect or that, you know, have a stake in your career, you, you, you'd you want to fix that immediately. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then finally here, we have some vault hours that you do with mm -hmm. your customers, which is awesome. I love that you do that. Anytime we have sort of a live conversation, we have the potential for it to go wrong, right? Somebody puts in the chat, hey, I have this thing that I've been trying to troubleshoot. I can't figure out why it's not working right. 
here's a link to what, what it looks like in the trouble that I'm having. Maybe it looks like a drive link. I recorded my screen. Um, can you help me? I'm not sure what's going on. They're trying to convince you to take an urgent action. You're in the middle of this support hour with your customers. And a lot of times people will get tricked by somebody saying, I've got issues with this thing I'm trying to troubleshoot. Can you see it working on your end? Mm -hmm. Because as attackers, we're either pretending to be people that need help or we're pretending to people be people who can help you. Yeah. Those are like kind of the two categories when you boil everything down. So I'm curious, like you probably have seen people attempt to like trick you with a, a troubleshooting link or, Hey, yeah. I don't know why this isn't working. And I'm sure in your organization, you say like, Hey, we'll, we'll handle a link or, or something else separately outside of this. But, um, you know, what are your thoughts on people trying to trick you during vault hours? Yeah. I mean, you know, we, at Bitwarden, we are, we are very committed to customer support and customer success. And so if if that question came up during a vault hour or or any other scenario, I would say it is it really is in our DNA to want to drop everything and help someone and help a customer and and tackle something for them. And so I think that would be our first thought. That would be my first thought is to help help them versus Hmm, is this is this legit? I, I I really don't think that that would be the first question in my mind. The first thing would be, okay, this person needs help. We're gonna try and help them. Yeah, yeah. and that's why I love talking about like using a Windows sandbox that you can easily um, use with a, a Windows machine and saying like, absolutely, let me just fire up my sandbox. Go ahead and help you here, and then now you can support them, but you're supporting them in a safe way. That's kind of what I mean by being politely paranoid is we don't need to be cruel to people and not help them, or we don't need to assume that they have ill intent, um, but politely support them while also having your own paranoia in the background. And Okay. So Vivian, I was actually able to also grab your voice from the vault hours and use that for a potential voice clone. So mm -hmm. you talk, you, you talk quite a bit within those um, vault hours, which is useful because I only need about a minute to a minute and a half to make a good voice clone. So are you ready to hear kind of how your voice clone sounds? No, but go ahead. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Okay. So I took about, I'd say a minute of you speaking and I put it into my voice cloning tool here. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought to myself, what if I pretended to be Vivian to her team asking for a password because she's logged out? So imagining that you don't have a password manager and you're not able to share your passwords easily with your team or group, would it sound like you if I'm trying to kind of clone your voice? We'll see. Let's hear it. Hey, sorry. What's the password for our drive? Okay. Interesting. A little robotic, not really your cadence and the tempo is kind of all wrong. So I went ahead and I updated the voice clone to match a more natural human speech for them. So I wanted to kind of match the voice that I heard on your recordings. So I used the brand new speech to speech voice cloning tool to tell it exactly what cadence, tone, and inflection I wanted it to use by using my own voice. So here's my own voice saying what I want your voice to sound like. Sorry, what is the password for our drive? <laughs> All right, so that's what I'm gonna try and copy. Let's see if it makes it sound a little bit better here. Um, using the speech to speech tool, let's see if we can convince somebody to give a password. Hey, sorry, what is the password for our drive? <laughs> what do you think? Does that sound like you at all? A little bit more than the first two. Yes. Right. And a person so. who's not you seeing mm -hmm. your phone number on their caller ID and then yeah. hearing this. Mm -hmm. Hey, sorry, what is the password for our drive? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's much more convincing when you've got, that, yeah, you've got that spoofed phone number. You pick it up, you say hello, mm -hmm. and suddenly, hey, it's Vivian. Do you have that password for our shared drive? It's like, why would I not believe my caller ID plus the voice that does kind of sound like Vivian, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. We often see attackers use this to get sensitive info, get shared on docs, passwords, MFA codes, which is why, again, it is so important to not reuse passwords. So I can't just steal it from you once and use it everywhere. Use a password manager so you can easily share passwords with your group or team, not over the phone, and use multi-factor authentication so that if I, for some reason, am able to steal a password, I can't just immediately log in as you. 
Thank you for being such a good sport, Vivian. That is the end of <laughs> our live hacking demo and your voice clone. How do you, how are you feeling? I'm feeling like I need to be even more uh, conscientious of my <laughs> digital life. So thank you, Rachel, for uh, a, a little bit more of a wake up call. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. You're already using all the right tools. So I'm not worried about you. This is more so a demo for everybody else. That actually brings us to the end of our live hacking demo. So Vivian, you've been so brave and thank you for being uh, just such a good sport about this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel. Hopefully that was ed educational and interesting to folks. So um, we, with our last few minutes, I did want to go through the questions and um, make sure that some of some of people's questions are addressed. Let's see sure. here. Um, Amir asked earlier, what do you think, uh, what, what's your opinion on open source making it easier for black hats to see vulnerabilities? Hmm, that's a good question. The, the cool thing is that everybody can see vulnerabilities. So everybody's working together within the op open source community to fix those vulnerabilities. And so oftentimes in the open source world, we actually see vulnerabilities fit, fixed much faster than in the closed, uh, more corporate spaces mm -hmm. because they're out in the open. So I actually think it's more of a benefit as opposed to a risk, but um, yeah, I, I think it's pretty cool that everybody's working together to make sure that the vulnerabilities are addressed immediately because they're out in the open. Yeah, great point. And then Ra Richard asked, uh, does your company, I, I think he means your company, Rachel, see issues with uninformed adoption of password managers of unknown pedigree also being a risk? Oh, like a password manager that's not yeah. authentic, like a bad password manager. Right. Right? I have seen that, yeah, with some customers previously where, you know, somebody goes, it's mainly when they don't have a password manager that's sanctioned by the company, that's, prov you know, provisioned to everybody, where they'll say, you know, go in the app store, find a password manager, use that. And then people come back and say, oh, I used XYZ password manager, it had zero reviews. It seems kind of kind of sketchy. Um, so yeah, that's why I think it's really important that orgs put in place a password manager and then mandate that that's a password manager used. And then yeah. once people have a good experience with a password manager in their personal life, they can use something too. Like I recommend Bitwarden all the time for people in their personal lives because it's free for personal use. So I'll say, go ahead and use your Bitwarden and just like see how you feel about it in your personal life. Yeah. Um, and then Richard, where... I was looking at Richard's question and I can't find it. Oh, Amir had another question. Um, R Rachel, do you think big companies should replace TOTP with pass keys? Yeah. So uh, time-based passwords, like um, you get like a code to your phone, just so everybody knows what we're talking about here. I think that we're going to have pass keys become super ubiquitous. They're going to be everywhere over time. So Right now, we have uh, the code that gets sent to your phone that you have to read out You know, when you're trying to change your account with your telco, for instance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your one-time password is better than nothing to be able to verify that that person actually owns that device and is who they say they are. That's better than nothing. It can still be stolen or siphoned out by somebody pretending to be you know, your telco, for instance. Um, and we see that happen all the time. But it's better than nothing. And over time, that I'm sure that will be replaced by a biometric, like a face ID or a fingerprint scan or something like that. So I think we're going to gradually see that change, but that change doesn't happen overnight. Technology yeah. takes a while to get adopted. Yeah, I agree. And I think it kind of relates to Jonas's question is, do you think normal, quote unquote, normal users, maybe he means non-techie users, um, are ready for passkey-based solutions? Jonas Toback. I don't know many Tobacks. Now I'm curious <laughs> who this is. Friend me on LinkedIn, uh, fellow Toback. Um, do you think normal people are ready for pass keys? Absolutely. I think I think everyday folks are ready for pass keys, especially when they're easy to integrate. So when you've got them already using Face ID or their you know their their fingerprint scan or they've got a little scan on their keyboard or something like that, 100. Uh, they're super easy to integrate for folks because using a biometric to unlock their phone already feels natural for everyday people. They actually don't know the difference between using it as a pass key or using it as a biometric to get into your phone. So for them, it just feels like a natural extension of their typical uh, authentication behavior. So yeah. yeah, I think it's great. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Jonas, Jonas, just FYI, I, I just, we, uh, we have a weekly live demo every Wednesday to walk through the enterprise uh, plan of Bitwarden. And um, this past week, it was my turn, and I did a, a demo of setting, using pass keys to log into Bitwarden. Um, and what I did say is that it is, it is a new technology. It's emerging technology for Bitwarden. We use uh, the PRF WebAuthn extension, which is, like I said, emerging. And so the, the user experience will be different based on, depending on you know what operating system you're using, what browser you're using, what device, et cetera. So it, it, it's, it's not gonna be the same for everyone. And so um, just for, for normal users who are interested in pass keys and looking forward to a password-free future as I am, uh, I would just encourage people to not be afraid to experiment and try it out. And it's it might not work so smoothly or might not work as consistently, but again, um, it will. I have, I have full confidence in that. Um, and then I do have, a, we're, we're almost at time, and Amir had a question uh, about when will Bitwarden support pass keys for iOS and Android? That is actually on the roadmap and it's coming soon. So pass key for mobile is coming soon, Amir. So stay tuned for that. Um, and let's see. Yes, this stream will be available for replay. Um, and let's see, do we have one, one, one more question from Amir? What do you recommend as a great model for educating users on using a password manager and pass keys? I think it's really important. Yeah, I think it's really important for showing people how they can get hacked to understand the importance of something like a password manager. So I have a bunch of free videos on YouTube. If you say, type in Rachel Toback CNN or 60 Minutes, you'll be able to show that to say a family member or a friend and they can understand, oh, I get how they're stealing passwords. Oh, I see why it's so important to not reuse my passwords. That would definitely get me. I would lose access to my Gmail or my bank account or my Instagram with 40,000 followers for my bunny. How would I lose it? If they don't understand that, they're not going to understand the importance of why they shouldn't reuse their passwords and why they should use multi-factor authentication. But once you demonstrate it, it's very obvious to people and they get it immediately. Yeah. Well, that is a great way to close our time together. Um, and thank you so much, Rachel, for, for spending this last hour with me. Um, very informative, very educational. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Have, have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.